There's a new world coming. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a new world coming. To a new world coming. To a new world coming. Hello, and welcome to the premiere episode of our program, New World Coming, where we interview scholars, organizers, and leaders of the African diaspora from around the world. My name is Mia Tata, member of the research team here at the People's Forum, and I'm pleased to present our host, scholar, activist, and friend, James Counts Early, former director of cultural heritage policy at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife Programs and Cultural Studies. James has been a leading voice in the African diaspora and has spent his life connecting Afro-descendant movements across Latin America and the Caribbean. As a skilled critical thinker of culture, race, and capitalism, James has been a longtime friend to socialist countries, movements, and black liberation struggles across the world. In this episode, James is joined by UCLA professor Robin D.G. Kelly, author of books Freedom Dreams, Hammer and Ho, Race Rebels, and many more, to discuss Robin's scholarship on racialized capitalism and historic struggles for socialism led by black and indigenous peoples. They also discuss the misunderstandings of identity politics, how the analytical tools of race and class cannot be distinguished for one over the other, and what are the conditions of black workers today. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel for future episodes and other political education content. And you can also follow the People's Forum on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for other updates. You can also listen to this interview via podcast by searching for the People's Forum on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy this interview with Robin Kelly and continue to stay tuned for more interviews and special content. Welcome to today's interview with Dr. Robin Davis Gibran Kelly, American historian, social activist, and organizer, the Gary B. Nash Professor of American History at UCLA. Thanks, James. It's so great to see you many years. Good, good. Um, I want to start uh, this interview with a statement uh, in your publication, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination, uh, published by Beacon Press in 2002, uh, because it, it's so uh, apropos to this new world coming, where you're going to be standing program of uh, political education interviews here at the People's Forum in New York. Mm -hmm. And you write, quote, now that I look back with hindsight, my writing and the kind of politics to which I've been drawn have more to do with imagining a different future than being pissed off about the present. My point is that the dream of a new world, my mother's dream, was the catalyst for my own political engagement. Would you expound on that as sort of the organic background of how you moved into uh, an emancipatory perspective and projects both in your scholarship which I like to describe as an applied scholarship, mm -hmm. not just uh, an abstract look at history. A 20th anniversary edition of Freedom Dreams is about to come out with a new introduction and a new epilogue and new everything, uh, which kind of reflects on uh, where we were uh, in basically 2000, was when this, the book was conceived, and where we are now. What I was reminded of and what my mother you know, in terms of the way she raised us and the pol political work that she did reminded me was that um, there's no space for pessimism. Uh, that, in fact, you know, every day we engage in forms of struggle that are not always necessarily against the state, but sometimes just about you know, trying to create forms of mutual aid, trying to care for one another, you know, trying to uh, pay attention to what people need. And then then don't stop there. Then you sort of have to think about, okay, well, what is the world we have to create so that uh, mutual aid and care, so that you know, the end of caging of human beings, so that the end of precarity and joblessness, um, that the end of violence you know, can come to fruition. And we have to sort of imagine that and create that uh, in the process. And so I came up you know, politically at a time when it just seemed like we were always losing, you know, always losing these campaigns. Um, and I should say something else, which is not in the book. Uh, that same period when I wrote Freedom Dreams was also a period when a lot of, uh, and you remember this, like a lot of social movements were dependent and still are dependent on funding. 
on the nonprofit industrial complex that kept saying, look, we'll give you money if you have a winnable campaign. But the problem was that if you focus on winnable campaigns, that is those small steps of reform that actually might re-instantiate the same systems of domination, then you're not really, you don't really have the space to build or envision the kind of future that people are building toward. So the, the combination of all those things led me to try to write a book that was about radical movements even if they lost, lost, losing, winning is, is a problem. You know, the, the, the way we frame it is a problem. But, but those movements that were making demands for radical transformation that were far more visionary, even if they were limited, but still more visionary, whether the socialist and communist organizations, struggles for reparations, um, Black feminism, um, and, you know, struggles for, for land, you know, um, for nationhood, for nation status, you know, whatever that means. So, so all that in some ways, you know, was a product of the politics I kind of grew up with, but also was a product of, product of the moment, um, of, of movements saying, you know what, we're not going to take, we're not going to let funders determine for us uh, what our politics should be. And we're going to try to do the work of fighting for the kinds of reforms that will lead us to the future that we imagine. This generation, um, 2021, uh, polls over the last 24 to 36 months have suggested that as much as 40% of the millennial generation identifies with the term socialism. And thinking about the autobiographical dimensions of your systemic writings about neoliberal capitalism and racialized capitalism. Talk a little about your own identification. Uh, is it as a revolutionary nationalist who's a Marxist, uh, a socialist? Uh, I, I raise this because the debate about identity politics uh, mm -hmm. also rages uh, as that if you're into identity politics uh, and you're not really talking directly about Marxism or Leninism and socialism, you're really not talking about the uplift of the working class. How do you navigate that debate? What would be your suggestion to this generation of activists about right. the, the analytics that might be useful for them to engage the emancipatory and transformative projects that they are dealing with? Right. Well, you know, um, it's great talking to you, James, especially because you know better than, than anyone that there's a lot of confusion about what identity politics is, a lot of confusion. Um, there's also a lot of confusion about what our struggles have been. And, you know, given your own history, you know that there was no contradiction between fighting against racism, fighting for Black power, and fighting for socialism, and fighting for a kind of an emancipatory socialism for everyone, <laughs> for the globe, that there was no contradiction. No one ever thought to say, well, which one are you? You know, that wasn't really the issue. Even, I mean, there were splits within Black nationalist organizations at the time about whether or not to embrace Marxism or not. Um, and certainly there were nationalists who were not uh, Marxists or pro-socialists. Um, that's true. But among those of us who come out of, um, you know, what Cedric Robinson calls the Black radical tradition, those were not the contradiction. And in fact, one of the frustrations I have with the debate about race versus class is that Black workers, in the indigenous working class, Latinx workers, um, Asian Pacific workers have been at the forefront of making demands for uh, a, a multiple pronged approach to dismantle the racist state dismantle the settler colonial state and to usher in um, a socialist agenda, whether it's through the state or through local forms, that these things have been at the forefront and to build a labor movement that has been open wide enough for everyone. The problem that they kept encountering was white identity politics. That is an identity politics of a white working class that says, you know what, these unions for whites only. Um, we, we see you 
as non-white workers, especially black workers, as a threat to our own uh, uh, wage levels, that you're bringing wages down, you're bringing property values down. We're, you know, when in fact the state has created structures, racialized structures, that will determine value based on difference, which is to say, if you are not white or if you're black or brown, the value of your labor should be considered less, the, despite the fact that you're doing as much, if not more work, productive work. The value of your property should be valued less. Your va- the value of your life right, should be less. Um, and so part of the struggles that these movements have been pushing was to try to overthrow white identity politics and to demand a more inclusive, expansive vision of revolution and freedom that could include everybody. Now, having said that, there is a problem um, with a certain kind of neoliberal or multicultural liberal identity politics. And that is to say there are positions that people have taken in the name of being radical that a, we can't have alliances with anyone, you know, uh, because you know anti-blackness is the foundation of everything, and everyone's anti-black, so therefore there's no one that we could build a, a, a movement with. Uh, and then the other one is, you know, we uh, our politics should be centered around our racial, ethnic, gender, or sexual identity, without attention to class at all. Um, the idea of intersectionality isn't the isn't based on dividing up identities into these small bits and then choosing the one that means the most. Intersectionality was intended to mean a recognition of how they work together, including class, including class. So to really be deeply, radically intersectional is to recognize that Black and Brown working people have been affected, for example, by covid by the failure of healthcare, by precarious wages in ways that sometimes even the white working class hasn't um, uh, in the same way. And so we have to attend to trying to, again, transform or eliminate these racial structures, these racialized structures, uh, as well as ending capitalism. Because ultimately, um, capitalism has always been, from its inception, rooted in um, racialized difference, national difference, ethnic difference, and creating hierarchies around difference and gender difference. The African Blood Brothers, communist, mm-hmm. but that was an identity politic for the uplift of all of humanity. I would suggest that the whole issue of multiculturalism as a historically evolved phenomenon was a democratic struggle against monoculturalism. The problem, right. then, the problem comes up when it sees as, that as the end product of struggle uh, rather than the uplift of humanity from different historically evolved uh, ethnic or, or identity or gender identities and, and the like. And I, I, I wonder how you, you, you look at that historical reference going back to what right. the 30s, uh, Harry Haywood bringing the Negro national question, but then saw himself as an African blood brother. Right, exactly. Well, let me say one thing about about the concept of multiculturalism first and go back to to the communists. Um, because you know I, I try to to make the distinction between multiculturalism as it emerged as a uh, response to Eurocentrism, right versus the liberal multiculturalism, which um, evolved into uh, a kind of pro status quo that is that we will accept the status quo as long as people of color and women are then represented in the existing status quo a cabinet that looks different. like america the biden harris exactly. orientation yes, <laughs> yes exactly yes. exactly so you know we we get black secretaries of defense and you know black state department officials and Black CEOs who are doing as much damage around the world uh, as as the white ones, and so that to me is 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 a, a travesty compared to what multiculturalism was meant to be. But what is is actually done was take away the kind of radical politics and class dimension 
uh, which are, about which you're, you're speaking. Um, and that has been eliminated in favor of, of, of politics of recognition. And that politics of recognition is, is one based on like, look, if we only had more black cops, then you know, it wouldn't be so bad. If you only had a, like a black mayor, if you only had like a, a Latinx you know, governor, uh, you know, we, immigration will be solved, but it doesn't really work that way. The African blood brother, you're right, that was a form of identity politics as well, but it also means that when we think of identity, we cannot reduce it to skin, color, ethnicity, body type, desire, but actually think about it in terms of identification. That is, what are, your, what are the politics you identify with? So when people ask me, so what are you? Are you, you know, um, they say, well, you are like, you know, your, your accent, like, where are you from? What, what, what are you? Like, how do you define yourself? I said, I'm a communist. And they're like, what? <laughs> no, I'm saying, like, no, what are you? Like, where are you from? No, I'm a communist. And then they don't know what to do with that because I said, if I'm going to define myself, I could define myself that way. I don't have to. Yes, you could see that I'm a black person. You could see, you know, you, you may think I'm Arab or Puerto Rican or whatever, but I'm saying that this is the identification I choose. So to join the African Blood Brotherhood in 1919 basically meant that uh, you believed as Cyril Briggs, as W.A. Domingo, as some of the other leaders of, of and, and Harry Hayward, which, who was a member, uh, as they believed, they believed like three or four really important things. One, that black people in the United States are oppressed and they're oppressed as a class and they're oppressed as a race. Two, that the only way that they could defend themselves is to defend themselves um, through armed struggle, uh, through armed forms of self-defense, to fight the Klan, to fight lynching, um, and to develop a, a really disciplined organization to do that. Right. Okay, and three, that capitalism was not sustainable, not just only for their own lives, but the lives of all Americans and the rest of the world. And to say that is to say that capitalism is tied to the kind of colonial order that has made it possible for all these black people to end up in North America in the first place. Right, right. <laughs> um, and so that's what they recognize. And so they saw themselves as a black liberation movement whose movement was expansive enough to bring liberation for all. And that's why um, at the time uh, where the Communist Party had made a shift, even before 1928, and where Claude McKay, you know, the great writer, um, activist, shows up in Moscow and gives a speech to the Communist International and says, look, you know, you got to pay attention to Garveyism. You got to pay attention to the Black Liberation Movement. You got to, because because we are, in some ways, the wedge um, at the forefront of the class struggle. And, and, and that meant that the Communist Party suddenly said, you know what, we need to pay attention to Black people, not just as other workers, it's not that the socialists ignored black people. They just simply said, you know, you're just workers like everyone else. And what we need to do is stop talking the race talk and start talking the class talk. What they're saying is that we need to talk the race talk and the class talk. We need to talk about them together and recognize them um, as intertwined, but also see that they're distinct forms of oppression, distinct forms of exclusion, distinct forms of violence that are directed at black and brown people that are not necessarily directed to the rest of the working class. And so therefore we've got to uh, support the right of that community for self-determination. And self-determination means many things. It means determining what forms of struggle they're gonna take. It means determining what kinds of community-based in national organizations they're gonna form. And it also means in this particular context, the right to create their own nation. And, and would it also mean that while subjectively they may have an identity category, that the objective fight to express themselves, to be the demos, uh, to be the ordinary people, and the power of ordinary people to uplift hu humanity, objectively that intersects with the class proposition between labor and capital? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I mean, this is, I think, this really hits the problem right on the head in some ways because we, ha- it's, we have a narrow understanding of how class works. You know, I mean, we've had that, I mean, for a long time, that we think of class as simply an economic category and that that economic category is reproduced merely by one's relationship to the means of production. That is to say, you know, what do you, like, what do you do? What do you make? How do you get paid? You get paid wages, you're a wage laborer. Um, and, and of course, that doesn't work today when so many people work in not just service, but don't work at all or work as what, what, they, what we're told are entrepreneurs, but they're really in a gig economy getting paid on co- as contract laborers to do service. I mean, it's not even the same kind of capitalism. It's, it's, it's expanded. The finance, finance capital has, has moved to the point where gambling money on the part of banks or, take, or using debt to make more money, it just takes on a different kind of valence. But when we think about class as a category, class has never been separate from gender or race, nationality, location, age. All those things are so intertwined. So what does it mean to be, and let's just focus on black workers, to be a black worker is not just to be a worker, it's to be in a class, uh, but a, a fraction of the class that have been excluded from other fractions of the class. It's to be in a class that is doubly and triply subjugated and exploited by virtue of the fact that we have the system, systemic racism. Um, and that systemic racism affects not just the workplace, not just the wages you get, which are, of course, suppressed, but it affects things like, you know, um, if you own a home, the value of your property, um, if you need to get someplace, what kind of transportation is available to you? Um, if you, you know, are dealing with forms of, of so-called public safety or criminal justice system, how does it affect you? How is it that, you know, um, the black working class is more subject to imprisonment, incarceration, to um, surveillance than other segments of the working class. Um, and that's just the black working class, you know. And you then know? there's a psychological dimension that accumulates over generations, this yes. internal feeling, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you share a, a common relationship to, the, in a general sense, of the economic system, but your inner being, your inner self, uh, this is, I suggest, where a lot of the identity, catal- catalytic elements of identity uh, come, come forth. The biggest piece of evidence for the way in which the psychological dimensions of racial capitalism, that is racialized capitalism, work has to do with the impact on the white working class. And I always, I'm always driving this point home because to me, the hidden secret of racial capitalism's longevity, its ability to last for so long without collapsing, um, although through periodic crises, is the capacity of capital in the state to literally capture the white working class, to capture its identity, to tie its identity to race, to whiteness, and to masculinity. And this is what Du Bois called the wages of whiteness, you know? When he talked about the invention of personal whiteness, the idea that somehow you you deserve more by being white, and you actually sometimes get more, usually you don't get more. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. I mean, right, the white right. working class actually doesn't really get more. And we saw what happened in this past year with COVID, uh, with, you know, where I don't care how white you were, poor white people who had lost their jobs they weren't getting those, you know, they didn't get $2,000 relief checks. You know, they weren't getting vaccines right away. The terminology black radical tradition, is it fair to say that in the construct of radicalness, there are multiple ideological confrontational identities that emerge, one of which would be Marxist or socialist or communist, uh, but the radical suggests a plurality uh, right. that is confronting the systemic nature of the society, as opposed to those who would argue, well, it's radical, but it's not Marxist, it's not socialist. It's, I don't know if you run into that argument. It's interesting that you pose this question now because um, over the last uh, 21 years, 20 years really, since I published Freedom Dreams, um, I really had to 
to think harder and more critically about Marxism and its limitations. Um, and let me just give some background on this. So uh, my, my main teacher as a graduate student was Cedric Robinson, who wrote Black Marxism and, and coined the phrase of Black radical tradition. Uh, and, you know, and so much of my work has been sort of shaped by his thinking. Uh, I wrote the introduction, wrote a new forward to the 20th, to the next, the second edition of Black Marxism in 2000, and was really coming to terms with his critique of Marxism, which I agreed with, but for the most part, I didn't abandon Marxism. What Marxism is, is itself a plurality, actually. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a dead idea that sort of emerged in the 19th century and it got stuck. It's always living and breathing. Uh, but one of the things I had to come to terms with more recently was uh, what I call Cedric Robinson's anarchist, you know, leanings, you know, <laughs> um, which I didn't catch at first in his critique of, of the state, his really devastating critique of Marxism uh, for uh, confusing a specific radical formation, revolutionary formation coming out of Europe with it being universal. The idea that somehow the industrial proletariat, the European proletariat, uh, was the model or the universal class that will emancipate the world, Cedric is like, well, no, because first of all, most of the working class in the world, most of that is working people, didn't even look like the European working class. It's a very small piece of the Western world. Looked like. Colonialism, if anything, was the driver and slavery was the driver of a global capitalist system. Um, and those forms of labor were different. But then he says, look, you got to go back further. Two other things. One, um, if we think consciousness, a radical consciousness, emerges solely from one's relationship to labor, to one's to to the extraction of surplus value, rather than like, what's their culture? What do they believe? Who are their gods? Um, what do they carry with them? What's the relationship to ancestors? How do they think about land? then suddenly we have a limited understanding of what actually moves people to revolt. A limited understanding of humanity. Right. Uh, not just as an economic, reproductive system of food, clothing, and shelter, but uh, the superstructural dimension of feelings and well-being and uh, neighborliness and solidarity. Um, absolutely, absolutely. So, and that's why when you think about what's the black radical tradition, sometimes the, the maneuvers are more responses to, to memory. Uh, that is to say that for enslaved people, um, they weren't trying to uh, take over the plantation and transform it into socialized production. They were trying to get out of Dodge. <laughs> so they were like marinage. They try to leave. They try right. to create their whole lives all over again. Where is Marxism in this? What, what, do we, what do we throw away? What do we embrace? And I do think that some of, there's still some benefits to understanding uh, using Marxism as a way to understanding capitalism and its operations. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily the body of text that we turn to to predict what a socialist future might look like, for example, in part because, and Cedric Robinson also makes this argument in a book he wrote called Anthropology of Marxism, uh, and that is that socialism predates capitalism, that there were forms of socialist ideas right. that go way before, and not just around the world, but in Europe itself as well. So I'm, I'm mindful that um, many in my generation, I'm 74 going, hopefully I'll make 75 in January, uh, and many in a younger generation are really keen on needing a label. I'm a Marxist, I'm a Leninist, um, I'm a communist, not a socialist. Mm -hmm. And I'm mindful that somewhere Marx said something like, I never said I was a Marxist, I was just right. trying to bring some analytical tools to help understand how the world has evolved and what the social relations are and the contradictions and how they might be overcome. And in the your focus on a racialized capitalism and the black radical tradition, do you see intersections there? What would you say to this 
uh, current generation of, of activists who are working both nationally and globally about identifiers. These labels are tricky. And in fact, I spent most of my life trying to decide on a label. And it is true that if you weren't considered a Marxist, um, then you were just a liberal, you know? <laughs> or if you weren't, in fact, recently, I remember, um, uh, you know, we put out this, we put out um, Walter Rodney's lectures on the Russian Revolution. And we had a, an event at, at Verso Books and I uh, basically made some comments about materialism historical materialism and its limitations. And then I got labeled by friends of mine um, as an idealist. Like, you're an idealist. I said, well, I said, you know, why do we have to sort of fall into this trap? Um, as opposed to sort of saying, what are we trying to change? And what is the world we're trying to build? Right now, as, as we speak, um, the key uh, label is abolitionist. I think it's powerful, and I consider myself an abolitionist. But again, my concern is what happens when the label becomes either uh, a set of, of boundaries uh, that you can't cross, um, an, an epithet, uh, uh, a narrowing of our vision, uh, and, and or something you you sort of jealously protect. Right now, there's a lot of people who call themselves abolitionists who may not share the basic principles, but there's a kind of an appropriation of that. In fact, I, my biggest worry is uh, I can't wait till Target does this commercial on being an abolitionist. You know? <laughs> um, what is abolition? You know, Abolition, ultimately, if we really, really mean, if we really, really want to embrace the principle, it is the abolition of all forms of oppression, subjugation, and exclusion. It's about figuring out ways to, to be together by eliminating all the things that oppress us, including caging human beings, um, surveilling us, beating us down, creating a space for public safety, uh, and also other kinds of oppressions, oppressions of, that limit the body, uh, that limit our imagination of what gender is or sexuality is. Um, that these are all the things that need to be abolished. Which but is a new world coming in its plurality. Right, it is. Than, you know, one of the concerns I have, and I will use some old labels of ultra-leftism or dogmatism, and where I think ideology is fundamentally important about how you look at the world. And, of course, the ideal lets your reach exceed your grasp, the notion of utopia, I mean, those are ideal forms of a better world than this cruel world that we live in. But when people get overly focused on that, they really have a difficult time dealing with the messiness of this power struggle of governance and how we're going to arrange ourselves and who's going to get what, because it's messy, it's complicated. And mm -hmm. so when I am trying to look at different emancipatory struggles based on objectively what are they trying to change and less concern about what label they may be. But once we get stuck on the, you're not really a Marxist, you're not really a socialist, or the Black Caucus is just a group of handkerchief head. Uh, now I'm, I'm ready to deal with the contradictions there, but in the real uh, actual correlation of the power struggle, one has to make temporal assessments, not yeah. sort of abstract, infinite, categorical labels. And I, I want to uh, close out on, on two things. Um, one, this whole notion of the white nation. I, Bob Wing, uh, an old comrade of mine, has recently uh, put out a piece that has gotten a lot of response. And I'm just wondering how that's going to play uh, with those people who have a kind of... Um, what I would call mechanical class point of view is that you're discounting the, the white working class. And lastly, I'd like for you to inform us of what your new uh, book is about and what it may mean for this generation of, of young uh, social change and uh, transformative right. activists. Well, to go back to Bob Wing's uh, uh, article, which a lot of people responded to, 
and by the way, I've, I've known Bob many years and have nothing but respect for him. And I think the piece is very, very important. Um, and to me, I, I read it, I read the potential political outcome differently. I think he's correct that we live in, this is, you know, the question is, is this going to be a white nation? In many ways, that's what it's been. That is this, the essence of settler colonialism. Um, and, and the power of settler colonialism and the power of it today, as it was in the 18th century, was this ability to capture the white working class. That doesn't necessarily mean there's no such thing as a white working class. What it means is that now it will politically force um, a segment of or a block within white, the white working class to choose yes. what side are you on. Yes. Um, and to me, that's the challenge. And this is, a, this is not even a new challenge. I mean, uh, my, my friend, and the late uh, Noel Ignatiev, uh, put out this journal called Race Trader back in the, in the 90s. And I was on the editorial board of it. And his whole argument was like, if we really going to build a revolutionary movement, white people need to disavow whiteness. They need, they need to make a political break. It's not, it's not self-hatred he's talking about. He's saying right. make a political break from the white nation. Even the beginnings of settler colonialism in the 17th century, why did they... Um, ultimately abolish indentured servitude? Why did they offer poor white, um, often, I, I call them immigrants, but many of them were immigrants against their will, you know, who, who mm -hmm. committed crimes in Europe and got right. put on a ship instead of right. going to the hanging tree, they ended up coming to North America. Why would they give them, you know, 40 acres and a musket? Because they realized that they could, that they were running away, joining with indigenous nations they were running away, hanging out with Africans living in swamps. They were like, this is way better than getting beat by a whip and picking tobacco, you know, than being with you all. And so they were going native, as they say. The only way to stop that to, to, in its tracks is to make them white and to say, look, you too will one day become a plantation owner like me. Just, just, just hold on. Here, here's some land. Here's some guns. Fight for us. And so the question is, when would they break from that? That is the question. So I'm writing this book that's tentatively titled Black Body Swinging, um, an American Postmortem. And by swinging, I, I'm sort of using, of course, the line comes from uh, Abe Mirapol's uh, poem, which became the song, the song Strange Fruit, right. which, of course, Billie Holiday is famous for. But swinging has a double meaning. It's both swinging in terms of our 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 death, but also swing in terms of the fight back. And it's really a history of that, the long fight back. What happened uh, in the spring of 2020 wasn't spontaneous. Yes, it was 26 million people, but it, was, it took three decades of organizing that made it possible. Three decades, going back to the 1990s, the opposition to, the, to Clinton liberalism, um, and throughout the the first two decades of the 21st century, where you begin to see um, the seeds of the movement for Black lives, of groups like Dream Defenders, uh, Recharge Genocide, all these different organizations emerge, and they emerge with a sharp critique of structural racism, a sharp critique of state violence, an abolitionist vision of what the world should look like. And they began to spread that language, build the movements at the local level and national level, um, and so that's part of the story. But the other part of the book, a big part of it, is trying to understand the conditions that racial capitalism produced that led to so many um, premature deaths. And so each chapter kind of looks at a, uh, the death of someone and through a kind of historical postmortem or, or autopsy, I kind of trace back generations of their families' lives, the lives of the community, the transformation of those communities uh, to understand how we got there. All that story is connected in each chapter so that by the time you finish reading the book, you know what racial capitalism is, you know how it works, you know how it kills people, and you know who are the forces that will be its grave diggers. Robin Kelly, I wanna thank you for joining us at the People's Forum on A New World Coming. I want to reference your mother's dream about the new world, uh, which gave you impetus 
uh, to bring us to this moment. Uh, I'm excited about this new generation of uh, activists on multiple fronts, um, both in the radical tradition, uh, but also in the transformative uh, perspectives of new systems and new possibilities. Right. Uh, we look forward to the book. Thank you very yeah, much. Well, I, I so enjoyed this conversation. I just hope that all the people uh, watching know your history, which is extraordinary, because you have been my hero for these 30 years. I'm an least. old man, he's saying. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robin. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for the premiere episode of New World Coming with James Early and Robin D.G. Kelly. In this episode, James and Robin discuss the importance of race and class as essential yet inseparable categories of analysis and how to differentiate between intersectionality and neoliberal multiculturalism. As Robin states, to be a black worker is not just about being a worker is about being the most exploited and oppressed section of the working class and the experience of this exploitation in all facets of life. They also discuss the ways in which racial hierarchy has been used as a tool to divide the working class and the need for white people to break with whiteness and white supremacy. Robin also emphasizes the plurality of Marxism and how to use the history of socialism to expand what we know of a world beyond capitalism. Finally, Robin and James discuss what it means to be an abolitionist, which we believe is fundamentally about the abolition of the capitalist state. To see future episodes and other political education and cultural content, can subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also listen to the interview as a podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thank you and see you next time.